Hello friends, my name is Dr. Raja Dhar and I am Head of Department Pulmonology in Fortis Hospital, Kolkata. I am here today to do a 10-minute CME on gold guidance and hopefully I will give you some carry home messages which would be useful for you in your clinical practice. So what are the key considerations for the diagnosis of COPD? There's symptoms, so there's shortness of breath, dyspnea, persistent and progressive, worse with exercise and something which does not wax and wane like you get in asthma, that's likely to be COPD, a dry intermittent cough with wheezing especially during episodes of cough, that might be COPD. If there's some amount of sputum production when you cough, small amount, scanty amount but still there, that might be the sputum producing phenotype of COPD. The history of risk factors we've always known. If you're born with low birth weight or if you've had recurrent childhood respiratory infections, that might amount to a diagnosis of COPD. The symptoms and the risk factors together result in a lung function which shows a reduced FEV1 with an obstructed FEV1 FVC ratio. The spirometric gradation of severity is based on whether you have an FEV1 of more than 80% which is gold 1, if you have an FEV1 between 50 to 80% which is gold 2, if you have severe disease which is 30 to 50% FEV1 and gold 4 is less than 30% FEV1. The other important context is the quality of life and the quality of life as defined by gold is based on two different questionnaires. One is the MMRC dyspnea scale and you can see MMRC grade 0 starts off with only getting breathlessness on strenuous exercise or MMRC grade 4 which is the other extreme which is I am too breathless to leave the house or I am breathless when dressing or undressing. The other assessment which is slightly more detailed looking at symptoms is the CAT or the COPD assessment test questionnaire and this starts off with so I never had a cough, I have no phlegm, my chest does not feel tight, when I walk up a hill or one flight of stairs I am not breathless, I am not limited in doing any activities at home and this goes through different questions and you do a score between 0 to 5. That's the redefined ABCD assessment tool that's been in vogue from Gold from 2011. How have things changed? The most important change here is that spirometric confirmed diagnosis is a prerequisite before you enter the grid. And then again, based on spirometry, you assess the degree of airflow limitation. So that's the grade that I talked about a little while ago. And then when you go to the grid, there are just two different factors. The first factor is quality of life, which is judged by the MMRC score and the CAT score. The other important factor is exacerbations. Does the person have two or more exacerbations or at least one exacerbation, which is resulted in hospitalizations? So the role of spirometry is twofold. The first is in diagnosis, the second is in assessment of severity of airflow obstruction. There are certain follow-up assessments where spirometry might be useful. So for instance, you've started a drug, what's the response to that particular drug? If there is a disproportionate degree of airflow obstruction, you might want to think of a differential diagnosis or a coexisting illness. You might think of a response to pulmonary rehab. You might want to assess for transplant. So these are more fine print, hence the importance of spirometry is now more in diagnosis rather than long-term prognostication and follow-up of patients with COPD. The other important factor is with vaccination and important to remember that both influenza and pneumonia is important in reducing the morbidity of chronic respiratory disease generally but especially in the case of COPD. So inhaled bronchodilators are the most important treatment intervention in patients with COPD. As and when required short-acting short beta agonists and short-acting muscarinic antagonists are important in controlling symptoms in the short term. Similarly, a combination of a LAMA and a LAMA, so a long-acting beta agonist and a long-acting muscarinic antagonist together gives you maximal bronchodilatation. 
Combination therapy with the lava or a lama also reduces exacerbations more than monotherapy does. Tyotropium is effective in increasing capacity with pulmonary rehabilitation and hence improving exercise performance. And theophylline exerts a small bronchodilator effect as add-on treatment and has a modest improvement in symptomatology. Group A are patients with a low symptom burden and little or no exacerbations. You use a single bronchodilator there and your treatment of choice there is mainly a lava. Then you have group B, more symptoms, low in exacerbations and here you would use a lava or a lama or a combination of both drugs. Group C are patients where there are more exacerbations, however there's less of symptoms. And here you can decide between using a lama or an ICS plus a lama or a lama plus a lama. Group D are patients who you would always use first line as a lama and a lama. In some patients, you might end up using a lama plus an ICS. There are two facets you're addressing here. If you remember the gold grid, it's symptoms and it's exacerbation. So when we talk about symptoms, we talk about dyspnea and there it's a lava or a lava or a lava plus a lava. If you have more exacerbations, if you have a raised eosinophil count, you think about adding in the inhaled corticosteroid. With exacerbations, the mindset is similar. However, inhaled corticosteroids come in relatively earlier in a certain subset of patients here. And the triple, the lava plus the lava plus the ICS is something that you would use in these individuals. The low-dose macrolide, the roflubilast, or the n cysteine would be used as add-on exacerbation reducing strategies in these patients. Shortness of breath at rest, tachypneic patient, decreased saturations, confusion and drowsiness, acute respiratory failure, occurrence of increasing edema are all factors that need to be considered for hospitalization. In a hospital, you would always get blood gases done, you would get a chest x-ray done, you would give them limited oxygen, controlled oxygen therapy, make sure the saturations are somewhere between 80 to 92% for the risk of hypercarbia, make sure you record pulse oximetry on a regular basis, giving them short-acting bronchodilators, the oral corticosteroid, consideration of an antibiotic when bacterial infection is suspected, non-invasive ventilation when there's respiratory acidosis, and monitoring things like fluid balance, thinking of thromboprophylaxis, all of these are important. And in the very end, we cannot but not mention about COVID-19. So Gold strongly encourages people with COPD to follow all the public health teams mandates. There is no evidence at all that oral corticosteroids can make your symptoms or your infection any worse. Hence, it's important to make sure that you take your inhaled drugs as regularly as possible. And all aerosol generating procedures, be that nebulization, be that spirometry, etc., needs to be done when there's no other option. And if done, all precautions need to be taken by healthcare workers or family members who might be exposed to these aerosols. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I hope this talk has helped you in understanding better the management of patients with COPD and it will help you in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. Please visit the Gold website for the free set of slides which I have also used. Try and update your knowledge of COPD in trying to understand the disease better. Goodbye and stay safe in all your endeavors.